get into the Word of God, everyone turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7, if you can, and uh, we'll get into it in a second. So, who's at Audacious Conference? A lot of people, and last week, Reggie Dabs was with us, and uh, Reggie, every time is here, it's amazing. And uh, really does unlock something. And his response is always right where we're at. And it's almost like, Reggie, you spoke the right thing, right time. And we're ready to respond. And uh, conference was our best one yet. Most people, um, encounters in praise and worship were amazing. I don't know what, what you felt and what you experienced, but from... From where I was, it was pretty, pretty hot, not just temperature-wise. Preaching was amazing. And there's no kind of shortage of power, presence, experience, and encounters from God at conference. And when Reggie was here last Sunday, there's, there's no shortage of that stuff. It's almost like you come away, you've had a feast. And uh, the important thing now is to exercise, do something with what you've just eaten, right? And... Uh, Something happens if we, don't eat, if we don't do something with what God's given to us in the same way physically. If we don't exercise, then we just get fat. And, uh, you know, maybe there's a few fat Christians, not here obviously, but heard so much, been to every conference in the world going. Heard so much about the Word of God, but not applying it. And what's so important as Christians, we don't just be hearers. But we become doers. We exercise the word of God that we've eaten, we've consumed, we've partaken of. And, uh, and it's so important that we do that off the back of audacious conference. Let's not just have had a great encounter. Let's do something with it. Let's make a difference in our life. Let's shape our life differently. Let's reprioritize our life. And uh, I believe that summer is a great opportunity for every one of us to reposition, reprioritize, get some things going. And I love the English calendar. Australia, South Africa don't, don't get this opportunity because they're a bit more logical with their planning. January is the start of the year in every aspect. But in England, we need two chances. And so for us, September represents a massive new start, new season, church life, schools kicking back in. And then if it's not going too well, then... Four months later, you've got January, which is all good. But I reckon August is a great time. I personally do this, but I think it's a great time to reposition yourself and just reorder your life a little bit and hit September running. Don't wait for it to happen to you. And, uh, and just thinking about how amazing conference is, just feeling the weight of, right, come on, let's, let's get running. Let's do something with this now. Let's not just um, hear the word have a great encounter and, app and make no difference with our lives. But let's take it into our actual practical life. I don't know about you, but sometimes you can hear amazing words. And then you look back over the course of even a week and you think, oh, the word was okay for then. But now I'm in the reality of my normality. It seems like, I don't know if this is actually applicable anymore. Let me encourage you to do something quick. When you hear the word, let's be obedient quickly. Let's not be a generation that says, oh, you, well, that word is just too good to be true. That doesn't work in reality. Oh, I hear what you're saying, John. I hear what you're saying, Robbie, about changing the way we think and, and having an answer for our faith and, and under, getting to grips with what we actually believe. Yeah, I, I get that, but really it's not going to make much difference in my life. Often you can come away from an encounter with God and then only a few days later humanity kicks right back in and the enemy would want you to say, well, that was just too good to be true. We're going to pick up a story in 2 Kings chapter 6 and uh, the title of the message this morning is Too Good to be True. Too Good to be True. Verse 24 of chapter 6. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army, and he marched up and he laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city, and the siege lasted so long that a donkey's severed head sold for 80 shekels of silver 
and a quarter of a cab of seed pods, which if you look in your notes, is pigeon dung or pigeon poo. Seed pods is the polite way. So when on your car, seed pods. I had a few cabs of seed pods on the car the other day. We won't go there. We just did. Anyway, pigeon poo was selling for five shekels. Verse 33, the king said, this disaster, this famine is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? I'm sick of praying and asking and believing and hearing the word of God, but nothing changing. Why should I wait? Any longer, verse chapter 7, verse 1, Elisha, the man of God, the prophet, comes up and he says, hear the word of the Lord, God speaking. This is what God says about this time tomorrow. I don't know if you've ever uh, spoken to someone, they've just been desperately been praying for them, and then you think, I'm going to pray for you. And while you're praying, you just hear the voice of God speak to you and something direct, deliberate into their situation. And like here, this guy says, Elisha says, this time tomorrow. I don't know about you, but I would have been tempted just to eat that out a little bit longer to give myself some time. By this time next year might have been a a better response. But Elisha just thinks, I'm just going to say what God says. He says, by this time tomorrow... A seer of flour will sell for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer whose arm the king was leaning on said to the man of God, you've got to be joking. We're currently selling donkey's heads and sheep poo for hyperinflated prices and you're saying the economy is going to kick back to a normal state. Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, Could this ever happen? And Elisha says, you'll see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. To understand the gravity of this word from God that Elisha, the man of God, speaks, we've got to kind of look at the context a little bit and understand this famine was not just like they're a little bit peckish. This famine's been going on for a period of years And they're getting seriously hungry to the point where now a donkey's head is being used for food. Donkey's head is being sold at ridiculous prices. And even now, the state where even pigeon dung is being sold. People are so desperate, so destitute. They're just seeking anything, so much so that the king, as he's walking through his city, as he's walking through Samaria, he comes across a desperate woman on the side of the road who's crying. She's sobbing. She can't believe what's just happened. He speaks to her and he finds out that this woman, only the other day, had sacrificed her only son and she had used her son for food. She's desperate now, thinking all oh, the guilt that's just what's just happened, but her neighbor won't uh, reciprocate the favor and not surprisingly won't give up her son. And this woman now is desperate. This is how messed up. This is how disturbed. This is how destitute Samaria is right now. And it's into that environment that Elisha, the man of God, steps up. He sees the state. Where people are at, so disturbed that they're killing one another in order to just eat and stay alive. And Elisha the prophet comes to that kind of place. And can you imagine carrying a word from God that you believe God's spoken to me, I need to deliver this. And the word that he's got is so specific that he has to say a time frame for God to move says in chapter 7 and verse 1, by this time tomorrow. This is just a ludicrous word. It's just a ridiculous word. You can imagine the people overhearing Elisha's declaration. You can, are you joking? You can't just make a statement like, by this time tomorrow... Haven't you seen how we've been living all of these years? Haven't you seen the sacrifice we've been making? Haven't you seen 
the prices for just pigeon, dung, and severed donkey's heads. And you're now saying by this time tomorrow, the economy is going to recover to such a point that we're going to be trading at normal places. This is ridiculous. Elisha's carrying that word. He speaks it out boldly and the people here. And this man, the officer of the king, responds, it's just not possible. It's just ridiculous. Even if the Lord would open the floodgates of heaven. You really think this could happen? You've got the audacity to make that kind of declaration. The Bible says that this officer is the man that the king is leaning on. This is one of the king's chief advisors, one of his chief voices. You wonder why the king had no solutions. You wonder why the king was wandering around himself in sackcloth, destitute and desperate, crying out, saying, God, you've brought this upon us, and now we're not going to pray any longer. We've got no strength left. It's because the closest people to him, his advisor himself, was full of unbelief and doubt. I want to ask you, who are the voices that you listen to? Who are the people that you lean on to for support? That when you need them to come and bring some courage or confirm a word from God, what are the voices that you're listening to? Other people would say, oh, well, you know, maybe if, if God was going to open up the floodgates of he heaven, but he shouldn't have put a time limit on it. Should definitely not have said that where you're at and what you've been going through. You think this guy on the pulpit at a conference can say that? How are you receiving the word from God? How are you responding to the word of God? Because the officer was like, well, sounds good for a moment's inspiration. There's no application in that. He's just going to walk away from this service. He's not going to think about that word anymore. What, what does it mean to him? We're the ones eating severed donkey's heads. We're the ones literally scooping up pigeon dung. We're the nation that's been sacrificing our own children so that we can eat. He's got the audacity to say, by this time tomorrow, everything will be fine. Everything will be rosy. You wonder why the king had no answers. You wonder why the nation was in a state it was. Because the voices that they were listening to were full of unbelief and doubt. When you've heard God speak to you, you've got to protect the word that you've heard. The Bible says don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't just shout to everyone about the thing that you feel like God has spoken to you. Don't lean on just anyone for support. Don't just lean on the nearest person. Find someone's shoulder that's going to keep you stood up. Find someone that's going to confirm the word is good and true. And that you can live for it. The back of conference, think about, man, how many times have we heard God speak to us? We've got to make sure that seed does not shrivel up and die. We've got to make sure the weeds, though they come, they don't strangle the word of God that's been spoken to us. But we make sure we protect that which God has spoken to. And we make sure we treat the word of God as the very word from God. It wasn't just inspiration at an altar call. It wasn't just a nice little word for a moment just to help you through another day. Maybe God actually spoke to you through the prophet. Maybe God actually spoke something that's going to generate breakthrough in your life. Maybe when God spoke, it's because he wanted to fulfill something in your life. And his word to you was an initiating word to start a process. At the start, don't give up your word to the nearest ear, to the most convenient voice. Make sure you rest on someone who's going to keep you stood up. Elisha was prophesied. The officers 
shrugged it off as just a moment's inspiration that doesn't cause or create any application. It's amazing how quickly he responded here. As soon as God spoke through Elisha, the officer was straight and, oh, yeah, maybe that could happen if God opened up the, the heavens, but we know that never happens. Maybe it's just be, me, but isn't it amazing how quickly we can return to our unbelief? Isn't it amazing how quickly after hearing the voice of God to us, we can go back to the carnality of our humanity? We go back to doubt and we go back to pessimism. We go back to cynicism. But God speaks, let's make sure we don't return to those things. But we treat God's word through his prophets as his word to our voice. They weren't just listening to just some guy who had a little bit of inspiration for a moment. The guy that was prophesying was proven. His name was Elisha. Already by this point, as Elisha prophesies about the nation's breakthrough in the next 24 hours, you would have thought they would have heard about this guy, Elisha. They definitely knew this man, Elijah, and Elisha's the man that's carrying the double portion of this hero of the faith, Elijah. Surely they knew that. Surely they'd heard about this man, Elisha, who commanded bears to destroy his enemies. Have they not already heard about Elisha, the, the man, that, the widow who just had a small thimble of oil, was in debt, had no way to repay her debts, and yet this man, the prophet Elisha, went to her home, prayed for her, instructed her in the ways of God, and encouraged her to step out of her comfort zone, to find as many pots as she had the capacity to think about. Surely they'd heard about Elisha instructed her to pour out just this small thimble of oil. And as she did, as many pots as she could imagine and collect, she filled to the brim. Surely they'd heard about this guy, Elisha, this double portion prophet, this man of God. Surely they'd heard about this man, Elisha, who laid on the boy and this boy was raised back to life. Have they not heard about this man, Elijah, Elisha, who was opening blind eyes and healing the sick and he fed an entire army with just a few loaves of bread? And so when Elisha comes to their town and prophesies to them, surely they should have received it as the very word of God, proven by his countless miracles, proving by words that had been fulfilled. The word that God's spoken to you. God himself bothered to get to you in your situation. Bothered to reach down to your circumstance and, and all the, the intimacies of your situation. And he spoke a word to you so specific that in that moment you regained hope. In that moment a dream was birthed. God spoke to you. God has proven time and time again, right through the Word of God and through people's lives that you know about, countless stories in this room of healings, of things being broken off people's lives, of miracles happening. God has proven Himself. God is able to speak a word so specific that it changes you. We've got to take the Word, we've got to receive it as a word from God. Disbelief, dis, disbelief deprives us of the favor God desires for us. Disbelief is the disease that rots our disposition. This guy, the officer of the king, when he heard the word of God, he almost pushed it off as, oh, yeah, it happens over there. I've seen it happen for the little boy's family and seen it happen for... The army, we've seen the provision you've done for them. We've seen the healings of blind people that you've restored their sight. Yeah, we've seen that. We know miracles always happen in Africa and all the miracles happen in Asia and all the miracles happen in America and Australia. They happen everywhere, pretty much other than the place that I am. And we can almost excuse ourselves and disqualify ourselves by Pushing miracle territory any way that, that we're not. 
So yeah, maybe miracles do happen, or mer- maybe they did happen, but not today. Oh yeah, they happened a hundred years ago, but they don't happen today. Oh, they happen in the Bible, but they don't happen today. At which moment do you propose the miracle stopped? God is able to pour out his favor. He's able to heal your disease. He's able to provide right where you're at. He's able to speak a word so deliberate, so precise that it cuts between every issue and everything and every barrier you've got up. He's able to do anything. But we've got to receive it as the very word of God. It's amazing. It goes on in the story. and It's almost like the next story kicks in in verse 3. And the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 7 moves on to four guys uh, who had leprosy. It's almost meanwhile, you know, that, that's kind of happening, uh, happening over there. And th- this guy just will not believe what God's about to do. Any, anyway, just less about that for a moment. There's these four lepers on the edge of the city. The Bible starts on this new story about these four lepers who were desperate themselves. They'd been kicked out of this city, and they know that it's probably a good thing because back there it's in famine. The only problem is right where they're at right now is also in famine. They're on their own, alone, no provision, no resource. Their only hope is to go out into the unknown, to step into enemy territory, and to make this great kind of conclusion that we're probably going to die here, but we're definitely going to die if we go back to where we came from. There's maybe a small chance that we might live if we go into enemy territory. So off they go into enemy t- territory. The Bible carries on this story, and this the amazing thing that happens is God seems to go before these people who are the epitome of physical weakness. They've got no strength. They've got nothing they can do by themselves. No weapons they can use. No fight within them. They're literally falling apart. As the Bible says, they come up to the city. This enemy territory that's full of everything they could possibly want. Full of every resource. Full of cattle. Full of food. Full of gold. Full of silver. It's almost like in their weakness, God was strong. And in their weakness, with a few patter of a few feet, The Bible says the enemy heard chariots. They heard a vast army. Could it be that God wants to go before you? Could it be that your miracle, though you feel like you're tiptoeing up to it, in your weakness, in your inability, in parts of your life, may be falling apart? Could I suggest that maybe God sent his chariots before you? Could it be that he sent his army into enemy territory and God has gone before you in your weakness? He is going to be made strong. To their amazement, as they kind of sheepishly set foot into enemy camp, can't believe nobody's around. This story is so amazing because these two Almost unrelated situations, these two unrelated stories are going to converge in the most miraculous way. I'm going to suggest that maybe before you had no faith, you heard God speak, but you didn't respond. You didn't even receive it as the very word of God. You just got on with your normal, average, everyday life, living in doubt, living in unbelief. Meanwhile, God was setting up a new way to carry on the same purpose that he spoke to you. Could it be that there's four lepers somewhere in the world that are bringing about the miracle that you're looking for? Could it be that God is working on the other side of the fence and you don't even know it, but the two stories are about to converge in the most miraculous way? We've heard about stories about God, people in life saying, I just do not know how this happened. Something shifted, a a law changed, or, or a way things were done changed. And I just got the miracle just landed on my lap. I didn't have faith for it. I wasn't even believing anymore. But the miracle came to me. The king and his officer who were full of doubt, negativity, pessimism, didn't receive the word of God, were about to find out that God was carrying on the purpose that he said he would carry on. His word was by tomorrow you will be in plenty. Supply will go through the roof. The economy will be restored back to usual levels. 
in 24 hours. And even though they weren't partaking, even though they weren't participating, his purpose was still prevailing. Just a few moments later, the lepers come back and report this incredible miracle. The king and his advisor, his officer, can't believe what's happening. And so they send an envoy and fast track they actually step into. They see this whole city that's full of the answer to every problem they've been asking, praying, seeking, and now they've had no hope for. Suddenly, hope's been restored. Suddenly, all the provision they could possibly want is on their laps. 2 Kings chapter 17, probably the saddest part of the story. Uh, Sorry, 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 17. Now the king put the officer on whose army had leaned in charge of the gate of this new city. And the people trampled him in the gateway. And he died just as Elisha, the man of God, had foretold when the king came down to his house. It happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a seer of flour will sell for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria, just as Elisha had prophesied only 24 hours ago. Now they were physically seeing the fulfillment and reality of that prophecy. The officer had said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open up the floodgates of heaven, this can't happen. The man of God had replied, you'll see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. Verse 20, and that is exactly what happened to him. For the people trampled him in the gateway on the way to stepping into everything they'd been praying for. And the man right there and right then died. Amazing. Within 24 hours, just as the word of God had spoken, is now seeing the fulfillment of everything being restored to this nation. And yet this officer, who'd responded to the word of God preached with cynicism and doubt, pessimism and unbelief, Right now, as Elisha prophesied, he's physically seeing it happen before his eyes. But he's not able to enjoy the miracle. He's not able to eat of the miracle. How tragic that you can be so close to seeing the fulfillment of everything that you've believed for and yet not partake of it. How tragic that we could pray for something and then lose hope and walk away in unbelief and doubt. And yet God carries on His word to completion, to fulfillment. And we see it with our own eyes, and yet don't taste of it. How tragic would it be for a church, as we have prophesied and believed that together, we're going to be a church that stops the traffic numerically so large, that we together transform business, education, entertainment and sport, family and healthcare, media, politics, spirituality, one person at a time. We're going to be a church of 20, 30,000 campuses around Greater Manchester, Europe and the globe having a global impact. Isn't it tragic that that's going to be the case? And yet there'll be some that will see it with their own eyes, but won't eat of it. Through doubt, pessimism, just stayed by the back door. The king, the king's advisor, through his doubt and pessimism, just kind of hangs around by the back door. The Bible says that the people in the rush to embrace everything that God had set before them, just sweep straight past Him. Please do not let the miracle just sweep straight past you. Don't let the miracle just be something that you see and yet don't taste of. Participate. 
with the Word of God. Apply the Word of God. Flesh out the Word of God. Let the Word of God drop from your heart, burst into life, the seed of faith. Changes the way that we think. In turn, changes the way we act. Don't let the seed of faith in your heart be choked by cynical people, by pessimistic people, by unbelieving people who have, oh, we've got experience, brother. Rather, guard your heart. For out of it flow the issues of life. Guard your heart. Because out of that, seeds of faith will spring into life. They'll change the way you think. Change the way you order your life. Change your mentality. Change your mindset. And if you'll allow them to be protected, and you make a decision to activate that thought, it'll become an action that has the ability to change your world, which in turn has has the ability to change the world. How do you receive the Word of God? To you, is it a moment's inspiration? Or is it something that has the ability to change the world? Be a participator. Be a doer of the Word of God. Numbers chapter 13. So 12 spies went into, the, into Cain and spy out, see if it was worth taking and see if it was possible to take. Ten came back. And gave a bad report. There's no way we can do it. They've got, they've got really tall people. <laughs> they've got giants. They've got everything there. There's no way we can do it. Two people came back with an incredible faith-filled report saying, I reckon we can do it. Who was right? Both were right. All 12 of them were, were right. Because the 10 that said we can't do it didn't do it. The two that said we can do it, they were the two that physically stepped into and ate of a land flown with milk and honey. Too good to be true. Oh, Reggie. It's a great, great word. It's too good to be true. If you've made the statement it's too good to be true, then you're right. You'll see it, but unfortunately, you'll not be able to eat of it. Make a decision with the Word of God. I'm not going to say it's too good to be true. It might be too good to be you, but it's not too good to be true. God is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or you can possibly think about. All you could dare to imagine, according to his power, the work within us. It's too good to be you, but it's never too good to be true. Would you bow your heads?